Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining the webinar today to provide additional clarifications regarding the RFP for workforce development and entrepreneurship training. My name is Dr. Shirley Green. I am the commissioner for the Department of Recreation and Human Services. This afternoon, we have several members of the City of Rochester team who will, who will assist with responding and providing any clarifying questions regarding this RFP. Joining me today is Deputy Mayor Patrick Cunningham. From our budget department, we have Sarah Boyce and Christina Heilinkenthaler. From the law department, we have Andrew Query and the Deputy Commissioner of the Department of Recreation and Human Services, Sarah Fletcher. Again, we wanna thank you for joining us this afternoon. We have received a number of questions prior to this webinar. We have posted the responses to this question, the many questions we have received on the city website. Sarah Fletcher will provide in the chat a link to that document so that if you have additional questions, this certainly will be the time for that. At this time, I wanna share a few highlights regarding this RFP. We are encouraging everyone who is interested in applying for the RFP to be as creative as possible within some of the categories that we have shared. The proposals will fall, can fall into one of three categories, workforce development services, entrepreneurship training services, or both of these services. Special attention will be given to those RFPs, those proposals that focus on agricultural and green jobs, as well as re-entry into the work, workforce. Our, pro, our, our proposal should focus on programs, not capital projects. Again, it's important to note that we wanna focus on programs to provide for our community and the residents we serve. As many of you already know, these funds are provided through the American Rescue Plan Act. Knowing that it's important that all proposals address all of the requirements that are outlined in the ARPA documentation. Again, that information has been shared, but we can post the link to that as well. Funds for the proposals must be allocated by December 31st, 2024 and they must be expended by December 31st, 2026. Due to the many questions and clarifications needed, the deadline to submit the proposals have been extended. We have extended the deadline to July 15th, 2022. Selection and awards will be shared on July 29th, 2022. It is important to note that the agreements will be starting October 1st of 2022. We have encouraged multiple agencies and partners to work in collaboration if they choose to, to apply for the, to submit a proposal. However, there would be one primary agency of that work. So those are some of the highlights that we wanted to share and now we will take any questions that you may have that we have not been clearly identifying. If you have questions, we would ask that you would put them in the chat at this time. Sarah Fletcher has posted a couple of links for you to refer to as well. Do you want to read the questions? Question. Yep. We have a question. What is categorized as admin fees that are capped at 10%? I would ask that perhaps one of my budget analysts provide any information there, please. Hi, everyone. This is Christina from the budget office. I would say you what you would consider an admin fee is maybe what you might call it your agency's the indirect rate. So the cost of any of those back, back office functions in order for you to operate this program. Sarah, Thank did you, you want to add anything? No, I think that's perfect. Thank you. 
thank you to those who answered that question. We have another question in the chat. We have one clarifying question. We noted a requirement for a physical location in Rochester. However, we are a cloud-based solution providing automated career development and training resources. Our platform also promotes collaboration between various entities, including city agencies. Are we precluded from bidding? So I will, I'll start that and then I will ask uh, Andrew if you wanna add anything to that. So our focus is on city residents and working with our population here in the city of Rochester. If the services are directly for those locations, uh, for that population, we certainly would not want to preclude you. However, I believe that there may need to be an address that ties you to the city of Rochester. But Andrew, I would ask that you add anything else for clarification purposes, please. Uh, I don't think that um, there's any legal requirement, Commissioner, to, to really be physically located uh, in the city of Rochester, although I think that that was part of our RFP that we'd have these providers within the city of Rochester. Although I think the way the question is framed, um, where they're asking if they're precluded from bidding, my answer would be no, they're not precluded from bidding at all. Um, if you think that you might have an eligible product pro project, excuse me, uh, we would encourage you to submit a proposal. Thank you. Do you want me to read the next one? Um, yes, you can go ahead, Sarah. Okay. Is it possible to receive it? Quite a, quickly. Yeah. Is it possible to receive a partial award? You can go ahead and. and yeah. So we um, don't. We. Uh, we are actually looking for multiple awards, so we're not looking to expend the 14.5 uh, million on one agency. Um, if you are looking, you know, if your project has multiple funding sources and you only need a portion of the project funded, that is also okay with us. Uh, the next question, yep. I just was going to add that uh, to what Sarah said. Certainly, we are not looking for one agency to apply for the entire 14 million dollars. We are looking for uh, agencies to consider a portion of that $14 million. And I next think question. that would answer the next question as well, where it talks about minimum or maximum. It is about what you're looking to do, what you can do within that time frame, and then that's the amount of requests you would make in your proposal. Sarah, you can go ahead with the next question. So the next question is, can you clarify the distinction between programmatic and capital expenses? And if any capital expenses are permitted to be included in the budget? Um, so I'll defer to um, one of the, to Christina from budget. Sure, so programmatic expenses would be what your organization needs to essentially pay for the day-to-day -day operational costs of delivering the services that you would be provided. Whereas a capital expense might be for something that has a long useful life, like a vehicle or a building or even a renovation. So the department is looking for requests that supports programmatic expenses, not capital expenses related to workforce development. Thank you, Christina. Sarah. Next question is, can we use our federally negotiated indirect cost rate, usual with federal funds? Uh, for this RFP, I believe the city has indicated that they're only willing to consider a 10% indirect rate, not a federally negotiated indirect cost rate. And Dries or Law, please jump in if I'm mis misstating that. Yeah, that's what we indicated in the, the FAQ. 
I, I see a few questions, Sarah. I'll go and do a few and then I'll let you come back. There was a question about more multiple agencies submitting a proposal. Yes, that is a possible. You just need one uh, lead agency within that. Uh, and another question that asked about the total amount, and I believe that has been answered as well, that it is up to you to decide how much you think your work would cost to do uh, within the proposal that you submit. Sarah? Yes, yeah, so the next question is about um, MWBEs and the, and the fact that nonprofits are not um, eligible to become minority women-owned business enterprises, which is what MWBE stand for, stands for. Um, so the question is, are nonprofits weighted differently? And the answer is no. Um, however, there is, uh, I think it's a, it's a certain amount of money. Christina, feel free to jump in. If there's a certain amount of money, the um, there still uh, needs to be staffing, EEO staffing requirements, right? Yeah, so there are additional bonus points um, workforce staffing utilization for the project, which could assist uh, nonprofit applicants in receiving some additional points. The next question is for clarification, what are you looking for related to key customer contracts and purchase orders? Um, I'm not sure what the question's asking. I don't know if someone else can answer that question. No, maybe. Um... I, oh, go ahead, Andrew. Yeah, I think that question might be related to pre. Is it previous contracts? We're asking to to demonstrate uh, s successful programming in the past in these areas. Um, I think that's what that's asking, uh, and I think the response, Sarah, feel free to jump in if you have anything to add, but I think the response is something, you, you know, you're, you're trying to demonstrate to the city that programming will be effective or that it's evidence-based or something to that effect. Um, so it just helps the city to um, fully evaluate your proposal. So the next question is what specific compliance and reporting will contractors be responsible for from the compliance and reporting guidelines documents since the majority of the information in that document applies to the city? So I think I can answer that. Um, so th the thing about using ARPA funds is you are a sub recipient of federal funds. So any requirements that apply to the city by extension apply to your organization. Uh, so essentially anything in there that the city is subject to, we would ask you to also hold yourselves to. And I think based on that document, probably budget, or, uh, Sarah and Christina, you'll work with organizations to set up their reporting. Uh, guidelines and and all that sort of thing so i believe we'll we'll assist um people who ultimately get a contract with the city uh related to this rfp with with that sort of thing yeah i mean we've, we've already entered into some several contracts with organizations with arpa funding um and of course we were learning as we were going along here ourselves with arpa being brand new and no one having experience with it but uh, in that time, we've been able to work with several organizations to identify the type of information that needs to be tracked and collected and submitted to the city on most likely a quarterly basis um, as that lines up with the reporting that we then have to do to Treasury. So uh, yes, we will provide uh, some guidelines on that and, and some formats for you to use. Thank you both. Um, the next question that I see talks about the funds being expended through the end of 2026. I know this is a budget uh, and they're asking, can, could we design the program whose services run until the 26, uh, 12, 31, 26? I know the monies have to be expended by that date. Uh, Sarah or Christina, anything else there? Sure, I'll take that one. So it's a little tricky because the funds have to be what we call obligated or encumbered by December of 2024. So we're going to have to do a little um, 
maneuvering to look into whether we're doing one-year contracts, two-year contracts, three-year contracts, or whether it's a one-year renewable contract. Um, so all of those decisions will be made going forward. But we all funds must be encumbered in a contract or a PO or something to that effect by December of 2024. And then you have an additional two years to actually get the money spent. Um, it's probably designed a little more for like a capital project where you've uh, planned a big project and it simply takes time to build the, the structure, um, but it does apply also to programmatic costs. So that's a little bit of a tricky piece to this that we're going to have to manage as we go forward. So yes, you, I guess the short answer is yes, you can design a program with services through December of 2026, but know that if it's not encumbered by December of 2024, then um, we do not have that additional time. Thank you. Sarah Fletcher, I'm not sure where we are with questions. I'll let you yeah. go. Uh, how will mobilization costs be covered since there are no advanced funds? I think that that's something that your organization needs to think through before writing a proposal and understanding that the budget does not, uh, this uh, opportunity does not allow for advanced funds. Does anyone else have anything else to add? Okay, next question is, can you please give a short distinction between being awarded funding via a grant versus through a professional services agreement? Which tool is used for what scenarios? So Andrew, I think that's a question for you. Sure, uh, the city will, so essentially what we're looking for is for you to submit a proposal to describe the pro programming that you want to offer um, and then once we have a chance to look at your proposals, we will uh, reach out to if we if if your proposal is successful, we will reach out and we'll discuss how it will ultimately be structured. But it's very difficult for us to work uh, in in hypotheticals and say off the bat, yeah, this you know certain programming is best addressed by a grant versus a, a subrecipient professional services agreement. But that being said, uh, you know, a, a grant might be something like, oh, we need a couple more staff people to carry out programming that we already offer, whereas a professional services agreement might be, uh, you know, um, we want to offer these particular services. So the way that we'll ultimately tackle it um, will depend on the content of a successful proposal. So the next question is, are there specific jobs that you are looking to support through the workforce training services? Um, so the short answer is no, but there is particular focus on green jobs and um, architecture, urban agricultural jobs. Um, so there's different weighting for those uh, programs that provide those services, um, but uh, the full answer is no, we're not looking for a specific, like it has the funding has to be for this training for the specific industry or not. Any other responses to that? Just along the same lines, we're looking for creativity. We're looking for what we know the community's looking for. So we're not tying anyone in to say, this is the type of uh, job that you need to design but we do want you to be mindful of what is the need in the community. So the next question is, can the city's recreation centers partner with agencies submitting a program proposal? If you are allowed to be a partner or a collaborator, who do we talk to at the city while we are preparing this? Since I presume there are rules uh, during the RFP project about communicating with city officials. Um, so we are the city's recreation department. Uh, commissioner Green is the commissioner of uh, the recreation of uh, Department of Recreation and Human Services, which includes the recreation centers. So the short answer is no, we would not um, be looking at proposals to, to partner with us seeing as we're trying to find uh, outside organizations to run these programs. Is there anything else that anyone else has to add? I would add, you know, it's it's similar to the answer that I gave uh, related to um, whether we'll structure an award as a, a grant or a PSA. I think ultimately, uh, 
you know, if you propose that the city will be involved in some way, that's something that can be talked about if if uh, we find a proposal to be interesting. However, we are interested. We 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 would be willing to discuss um, having services be at our centers to answer the underlying question. So next question for great. Uh, oh. The next question. Yep, go ahead. Um, so uh, for green initiatives, utilizing cultivation training in cannabis, can farmland be used as a training aside, aid be in another county outside of the city? Uh, Andrew, do you want to answer that one? Um, this training aid. I think that's more a question for Dries than it is about Andrew, legal. do you have anything you want to add about cannabis? That would, uh, is that sure. the question we're talking about here? I, I don't know if we've gotten there yet. I think that this is the one. Oh, I'm sorry. It does say cannabis. Thank you. Um, yeah, so these funds cannot be used in any way with any program related to cannabis because cannabis is federally illegal. We cannot use federal funds to run programs that use cannabis in some way. Uh, but um, as far as the question about other counties or outside of the city, I would defer to, to Dries. So I would I would say again, uh, as you've excluded cannabis, so if that's the need, that's a quick answer to say no. But if you're looking at some other program opportunity for um, farmland, we could consider the training source outside of the city because we know there's not a lot of farmland in the city to do that actual work. So if that's part of the proposal, we would consider that as well. Um, but as Andrew said, it would not be tied to, it could not be tied to cannabis at all. Um, Sarah, I'll let you go. Can the city provide a template for responding to this RFP to assist respondents in providing a succinct proposal? As currently written, the, uh, the required proposal content running from pages five to nine in the RFP will result in a very lengthy response from each applicant. Help is needed to streamline and organize the depth of requirements over five pages of required um, response content. Um, we have not put a page cap on this proposal. So as long as the proposal answers the questions um, and, the, and provides the proposal uh, required content, uh, that's fine with us. Uh, and just to follow up, there's no template. So this gives you the flexibility of submitting it in the format you choose to. Um, I do see the next, another question, Sarah, I'll go to if you don't mind. Does this proposal provide flexibility as the ages of those participating? Can youth ages 15 and over be included in innovative projects that target school youth as well as youth in circumstances related to criminal justice? Yes, this is open to all ages. And certainly um, we talked about the focus could include re-entry. And so uh, when you talk about youth in the criminal justice system, that could be part of re-entry into the workforce as well. The next question I see says, can you clarify whether awardees would be considered sub-recipients sub or could they also be considered guarantees under the SLFRF definition? Uh, I, is that a question for Andrew or Sarah Fletcher? Andrew. So I'm trying to understand the question. Would award, whether awardees would just be considered subrecipients or could they also be considered grantees? Again, it, we're sort of talking in hypotheticals. Uh, it's difficult to say how it should be structured without knowing what the project is. Um, so I, I think the, the response to this question is that you should, organizations should submit proposals and we will evaluate them. And if, if we have any further questions, um, then, then we can go from there.
The next question is, uh, is there a way for applicants to receive an adva initial advance of funds for itemized expenses to support startup scaling up programs? So we are not, um, this uh, RFP does not include uh, startup funds. Um, sorry, I'm confusing. Advances, we're not doing advances, but yes, we could do, um, we could do startup or scaling up of programs. Yes, sorry. The next question that I see says, with similar operator type agreements, can the awarded organization seek professional services and consultants during the contract negotiation phase? How can the city link those specialized services as if not part of the selected proposal? Sarah, is that one for you or Andrew? It seems like this question maybe relates to subcontractors of the sub recipients. That's how I'm interpreting it. And I would say for evaluation purposes, you will want to indicate in your budget where you anticipate needing to subcontract out further work and law will work with awarded consultants in the best way to structure those types of agreements. And Andrew, I see you unmuted, so please feel free to jump in. Yeah, it's sort of a, a difficult thing for us. I, I wouldn't say that we will help the sub recipients to, to structure legal agreements with other organizations. I think that's up to the sub recipients and their own legal counsel. Um, we don't offer legal advice to the public. However, the city will require that sub recipients submit these agreements to the city for us to review. Um, and we would ultimately have to sign off on them. Um, so I, I would say that's part of the contract negotiation phase, or maybe after a contract is signed, we could take a look at these agreements. There, there are a number of ways that we do it. I think it depends on the nature of the services that are being subcontracted. So that, that's something that I think we would talk about um, with a successful organization. Uh, the next two questions that I see, one is will larger proposals be given preference over smaller ones? And if an application is for programs totaling a million, will the application be approved or denied as proposed or could the city propose awarding lower funding? And so we talked about this previously. Um, we're not giving a preference over a larger request than a smaller request. It's a total amount of money that we're looking at giving. It all depends on the proposal that you submit and we're not gonna approve or deny based upon your total uh, request. It's about the programmatic needs that you provide to us. That will be our focus on what we're looking at. Um, so those two kind of go together, Sarah. I may have missed some, I'll let you go. There there was one before that that said, what is the difference in staffing questions in the proposal um, for a and uh, B8? And the answer is there's not much of a difference um, that I can see. It, it's just the resumes of key staff that are related to this project. Andrew, is there anything that I'm missing? Um, no, I think you covered it. Uh, the next one I see is about the weighted evaluation criteria. It is in the RFP. Um, uh, let me see, where do I see it? And uh, we'll make sure uh, it's in section, in the evaluation criteria on page two, uh, 13. If you are applying for both workforce development and entrepreneurship, do we do separate proposals or one proposal with two sections and two budgets? I believe you could submit them separately it's really up to you from your organization you can't uh, submit it but i'll i let our finance folks answer that as well um i believe the proposal does ask for two separate um if you're applying for the two separate categories or if you're submitting two separate proposals you would want to do two separate budgets thank you 
Sarah, I'll let you go to questions because I may have lost track. You're on mute, Sarah Fletcher. Yep, I was just getting to the next oh. one. Um, are there direct grant allocation or distributed? Are these direct grant allocations or distributed in net uh, 30, 40, 60? I think they're gonna get invoicing uh, net payment terms. Uh, typically in the in the contract or the PSA, when we set it up, we determine what the payment schedule will be. That will also come out during contract negotiation or agreement negotiations. Right. Uh, what is the difference in marketing questions in the proposal A12 and B7? I believe that we're just, we're looking for uh, how to recruit your plan for recruiting participants into the program that you're proposing. Am I missing anything maybe, Andrew? I'm taking a look. I don't see an A12, but I'm trying to get more context for the question. I'm sorry, A2, A2 oh, and A2. B7. Okay. Yeah, I'd, I'd agree with what you said, Sarah. The next question is, are organizations encouraged or discouraged from submitting multiple proposals as both sub-applicant sub or solo applicant? Um, the RFP does not stipulate um, whether, or not there, uh, whether or not there's a penalty for uh, submitting multiple proposals for different programs, whether as the main applicant or a sub-applicant. Anyone else have any thoughts on that? No, and I think that gets to the next question. That's the well. next question too, yeah. yeah. Will a proposal be scored less if the program cannot be sustained without grant funding after December 31st, 2026? Um, can't say if it's going to be scored less, but that will be in part of the consideration. Um, and I, I believe that there's a section of the RFP that's requesting sustainability. So if the program can be sustained after the opera program ends on December 31st, 2026. So that is part of the proposal that we're requesting. Any other thoughts on that? Uh, Livingston Associates is a service provider for the construction industry, partnering with over 20 different companies who are actively hiring. We also provide workforce development training. Um, would we be able to apply to uh, bring on career coaches to help assist our candidates once they've been placed in careers? Andrew, you want to answer that? Yeah, I think so. We're getting a lot of hypothetical questions that I think can't be answered. At, at this stage, I think if you think you have, if you think your organization has an eligible program, um, then we would encourage you to submit a proposal and uh, any evaluation of your proposal will be done um, once everybody's proposal has been submitted. Are for-profit businesses allowed to include profit in their budget? Um, Andrew or Christina? You know, I think, are we, I, I think one of the program criteria we had, I don't think we're, we're precluding uh, any, um, any proposals. So if you, if you think your organization is, is uh, able to, uh, has an eligible use, um, then we, we'd encourage you to submit a proposal. Uh, but I think one of the criteria that we put in our RFP was that we have a preference for not-for-profit type organizations. Um, but we would ask if you do, if you are a for-profit business that you would include your profit in the budget. And Sarah, did you want to expand on that? No, I think I think any organization is simply going to provide what it costs um, in their estimation to provide the services and we'll evaluate it accordingly. Sarah, 
So the next question is, does the city simply want the name and contact information or references for purposes of validating respondents' experience and success, or do you require more of a recommendation letter? Commissioner? Um, I think it's important that you seek out the uh, best way to uh, recognize your work. And so if you think just giving us a name and uh, address is going to help you to be uh, recognized, or do you think a recommendation letter is going to give you more um, opportunity for us to see a better picture of you? So that would be up to you. Next question is, is percent complete billing an option for businesses that sign professional services agreements? Uh, I, I, again, I think that would just be part of our negotiating of terms in the PSA. Would you agree, Andrew? I would, yeah. Can you clarify that the 10% admin fee is related to grant reporting and admin and separate from any staff that is required to design and deliver the program? Well, it is separate from the staff that are delivering the program. Um, usually it's, it's not people who are involved directly in the day-to-day -day, uh, programming. So it is, we tend to think of it as back office functions, um, legal, budget, accounting, that sort of thing. Typical Usually overhead, is, typical overhead costs or typical indirect costs. People call it different things. It's typically the things that span across the entire organization rather than the specific project. Um, Sarah, I'll go ahead with a couple of questions that I see. Can an organization submit a proposal in each of the three categories? You are certainly open to submit as many proposals as you see fit. So when you say the three categories, it's workforce development, entrepreneurship, and then the two together. So certainly you can submit more than one proposal. Um, define encumbered. Does this mean the contract is agreed to? I'll take that one. Uh, that's one of the things it means, yes. Yeah. So that would be a, we don't encumber the funds until we've chosen the proposal, gone to council, gotten council approval for the proposal, and then uh, actually entered the contract that has been signed by the vendor into our finance system. At that point, it becomes encumbered. The next question says, will additional weight be given for entrepreneurial training that serves people re-entering the community with uh, criminal justice background. So we do talk about in the proposal about uh, special attention and waiting to agricultural and green jobs and uh, focus on individuals re-entering the workforce. So those would be considered as part of the wait as well. Is there a preset distribution allocation between workforce development and entrepreneurship? No, there is no preset distribution allocation uh, at this time. We're just looking at the number of proposals we get, what people are looking to do, and then we will make the distribution and allocation based on what we receive. What about CBD and H and hemp? Um, I don't know those acronyms, so I'm gonna ask someone else to answer. <laughs> uh, it's another question about cannabis. Um, so this is something that we would have to look into. I believe that hemp is federally legalized, um, but I don't know much about CBD and whether the city would be interested in, in going in the direction, assuming it's for human consumption, or I don't know, there are likely FDA regulations that would also be implicated if we were to do a project in involving CBD. So uh, it's a long way of saying it's something we'd have to look into. Um, and if you think that it is eligible and legal, then we would, uh, we would encourage you to submit a proposal. Um, I just want to let our participants know, uh, do a time check. It is 345, and there looks to be uh, a number of additional questions. We certainly have this until 4 o'clock. However, we will make sure we uh, save our chat 
and provide responses to this. What I'm gonna do is, uh, Sarah, I'll let you read the next one. And then I'm gonna scroll through and see some questions that are different that we have not asked. So you can take the next one and I will scroll through. Are services that would be provided by a grantee only allowed to be provided to city residents? Or if the services are provided in the city, can some participants be from other parts of the greater Rochester region? Um, since this is a, a city contract, um, we say that all, uh, all services that are covered by this grant fund go to city residents. What is meant by clear definitions of workforce development and or entrepreneurship training in C1 of the proposal? Uh, we're looking for proposals to define what workforce development is um, and how their programs and services relate to workforce development. Is that right, Andrew? Anything else? Yeah, it's just, a, I think, a, a point of clarifying what an organization considers to be workforce development or entrepreneurship training. Uh, Sarah, I'm going to skip down to one that I don't think we've asked before. It says, must subcontractors be an entity or corporation that is registered to do business in New York State, or can they be an individual contributor? Might be an Andrew question. Where's the question, Commissioner? Is that like uh, a sole proprietor or is it? I'd scroll down to the 337 mark. Okay. And it's from day. Uh, it says, must subcontractors be an entity or corporation that is registered to do business in New York or can they be an individual contributor? I don't know what's intended what individual contributor means. Um, the city enters into contracts with organizations outside that are, are based outside of the state of New York for the benefit of city residents all the time. Um, so I, I suppose we, we would ask you to make clear that you're not located or, or incorporated in the state of New York. Um, but I, I don't see any reason why you would be precluded from submitting a proposal. There's a question that um, I see lower down. It says, by vendor, do you mean the awardee or someone supplying or subcontracting for the awardee? That, that one's probably my fault. A vendor is a consultant, is a subrecipient. We just, we tend to use the terms interchangeably. So the vendor, I suppose, would be you if you are successful in your proposal. Uh, I see another question. For youth participants, this work has the promise of being providing prevention model as well as intervention opportunities, especially for school-based programs. Would this approach be welcomed by the funder? Certainly that is an approach that you can take when you're writing your proposal, that you can include a prevention as well as an intervention model. Uh, we are certainly looking for ways to in, uh, provide opportunities for our youth as well in our community. So we're looking for those creative ways that your proposal can highlight that. Sarah Fletcher, I was just scrolling, so I know I missed a lot, but there's anything you saw that we want to come back to that we have not asked. Um, there was a question about um, if an organization doesn't have the full budget for the for the program kind of secured, would we be awarding um, funds towards a project that doesn't have full funding secured basically, is, I think is the root of the question. So I, I mean, we have a total amount of money. We're gonna look at all the proposals and we're going to select the, the uh, awardees that have great proposals that can meet the needs, what we're looking for. And when we're doing that, we're gonna consider the amount, the total amount so that we can make sure we offer uh, the amount that you need to do the work. However, as we're doing this work, if we need to uh, make some adjustments, we'll reach out to you as needed. Um, another question about, can we focus on training the nonprofit workforce? 
I don't see why not. <laughs> yes, I think is the answer. Um, something about reporting cadence. Um, right now we are having our other ARPA subrecipients report uh, monthly, um, but the city has to do quarterly reporting to the federal government on the use of ARPA funds. Um, will it require both data and a narrative report? Uh, currently the monthly reporting that we receive um, is uh, qualitative. Uh, sorry, da it's data, it's data, it's not, it's not narrative. Will the recording from today's session be available to attendees? Yes. Yes, we are recording this and we will be putting this on the website with the uh, responses to the questions. Actually, I think there's only one more question left. Okay, um, go ahead. My understanding is that if CBD comes from hemp, it is legal. If CBD comes from marijuana, it is illegal on the federal stage. I think that is to your uh, response, Andrew. Yeah, I can't answer that. Um, you know, I think it's a more complicated question than that. Uh, it's something that we would consider and we would look at the legality of, but, you know, we're, we, we can't give an answer today. On, on the question of CD, CBD and hemp. Uh, the last thing I see, will all the questions be answered in the FAQ? So we have this recording. This has answered all of the questions that have come through the ch chat. So we will make sure the uh, recording is posted. We will not go in turn, answer all the questions again. We will just be through the recording. Um, There's one more one more question about um, target population. Yes, that we should probably answer is a variety of target population uh, eligibility requirements listed in the summary of the ARPA final rule in terms of income levels. Um, do we have to indicate which we're serving or does the city have income uh, level eligibility criteria? I think all, all we can do for this one is direct organizations to the final rule and their interpretation of the final rule. Um, I, I feel like going any further than that is, uh, you know, the city providing legal advice for organizations. I, I can tell you that when we review a proposal, we, um, or, or rather when we enter contract negotiations, part of that will be the city determining determining whether we think a project is eligible under ARPA. And part of that will be target populations. So having information on who um, and, and what populations your organization intends to target will be helpful for us in making those decisions. And Andrew, if I could just jump in, the first question on the um, posted responses from this RFP deals with target population and there is a specific definition of that they use that the feds use for unemployed and underutilized labor that you will want to familiarize yourselves with. Uh, it looks like two additional questions came in. I think Sarah, did you did you mention the target population already or demographics? Okay. That's what we were just talking about, yeah. Okay, and then uh, the extension changes the October date. No, we're still at the October date because uh, we only shifted a week. So we're still in line to submit this for uh, council approval in time to start in October. Um, and I wanna build on that real quick. There was a question earlier about whether you can propose a program that runs through December of 2026. Um, and I did say yes. We're leaning towards thinking it would be best to end a program by September of 2026, so that we have the last three months of that year to actually make payments, because we believe that's what the federal uh, requirements will be, that actually all payments are out the door by December of 2026. Thank you for that clarification. So at this time, I just want to thank all of our participants. It looks like we had up nearly 85 or plus uh, participants today. So we certainly want to thank everyone for being here. All of the information will be uh, recorded, as I said. I see a last question came in that talked about refugees. I do believe refugees fall into that uh, demographic population that we talked about. 
So to answer that question, absolutely. And so again, this recording will be on our website with our proposal and Q&A section so that you can refer to it. And again, we thank you so much for joining us today. And we look forward to receiving all of the uh, proposals by July 15th, 2022. And again, thank you all for joining us. Have a great day.